Enter now. On September 11, 2001, shortly after terrorist hijackers crashed two U.S. planes into the World Trade Center, hundreds of brave firemen rushed inside the flaming buildings, trying at all costs to save lives. For most, it was their last heroic act. When hundreds of thousands of tons of steel came crashing down, they were instantly crushed under a deadly mass of falling metal. When the news broke, they became the heroes of our generation, and rightly so. Yet the New York firemen are not the only ones who have given their lives for a noble cause. History records the heroic death of millions, yet most have been forgotten. In this last episode of the Antichrist Chronicles, we will resurrect their stories and uncover the motivation that led them to sacrifice their lives. Let's join Steve once again as we journey deep into the Antichrist Chronicles. One of the most famous battles in American history took place in the year 1836 in a, in a small Spanish mission in San Antonio, Texas called the Alamo. How many of you have heard of the Alamo? Of course, just about all of us have. Mexico had been taken over by a dictator, a cruel dictator named An Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. This man, this cruel man, wanted to control Texas. And so he set out north with approximately, historians differ, 4,000, 5,000 men, and they marched toward the Alamo. When word got to the people inside the Alamo, of course, they were, they were greatly uh, disturbed about this. They knew it was coming. They were getting ready. They were praying. There was approximately, at least historians tell us, there were 190 people on the inside. Three of them, the most well-known, you can see their statues here on the screen, uh, Colonel William Travis, the commander of the Alamo, the legendary David Crockett, Davy Crockett, and then there was Jim Bowie, the co-commander. These men inspired everybody else. Legend tells us that before Santa Ana's army actually arrived and the battle was engaged, that Colonel Travis took a sword and he drew a line in the sand in the middle of the Alamo and he talked to his men and he said, now's your last chance. He said, if you are willing to defend this Alamo, to defend Texas, and if you're willing to die, then cross over the line. If you're not, then don't cross and go home. Historians tell us that every single man crossed that line except for one, one man. And he left and he went home. Finally, Santa Ana's army arrived and they attacked. And yet for 13 amazing days, 189 people inside the Alamo held off an army of four to 5,000 Mexican troops for 13 days, 13 incredible days. But then on March 6, 1836, four o'clock in the morning, the final advance with the blowing of the bugle, the final adv advance took place. Eventually, Santa Ana's army stormed inside the walls. And the fighting went on for 90 minutes. It was very, very fierce. They used pistols. They used their knees. They used their fists. They were, it was hand-to-hand. -hand, and it was intense. It was bloody. It was heroic. And one by one, the heroes fell. But not without taking down 1,500 of Santa Ana's troops. One by one, they went down and finally... The last group was backed up into a small church, and they were all killed, and the blood stained the stones of that church. And the Alamo, the Alamo had fallen, and there were no survivors, not one left. They were all dead. History tells us that when Santa Ana went in himself and saw all these dead bodies lying around, he made a an amazing statement. He said, it's a small affair, a small affair, how wrong he was, how wrong he was. Those 13 days had given the Texas general, Sam Houston, time to gather about 800 men. And just a few days later, in fact, it was 46 days later at the Battle of San Jacinto, 
under the generalship of Sam Houston, 800 angry Texans crashed in to Santa Ana's army, and at that time he had about 1,600 troops with him, and amazingly, with the cry, remember the Alamo, remember the Alamo, and remember Goliad, which was another, another place of slaughter by Santa Ana. Amazingly, these 800 men in a battle that took place and lasted for 18 minutes, they wiped out Santa Ana's army. They killed them all and took some of them prisoners. And the battle lasted, I said again, for 18 minutes, only nine Texans were killed. And what motivated them was remember the Alamo. They remember the heroes. They remembered Crockett and Travis and Bowie and these men who, who risked their lives, who gave their lives, who shed their blood for the cause of freedom. And this was the event, this was the event that made Texas free. Powerful story, isn't it? Amazing story. This story is known around the world. The Alamo has become a monument of freedom. Even in other countries, people know about it. There are websites, there are books, there are tour guides that continue to tell the story about the 189 men who were willing to die for freedom, willing to give their lives. People will remember the Alamo as long as time shall last. Now I invite you to open your Bibles. Daniel 7, verse 8. The Bible says, I considered the horns. There were ten horns. There were four beasts. There was a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon-like beast. The fourth beast represented the Roman Empire. And, this, and the Roman Empire eventually would have ten horns representing the breakdown of the Roman Empire into ten parts in Western Europe. And then this little horn would come up. And the little horn, the Bible says... Behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So we have a horn coming out of Rome located in Western Europe with a mouth speaking great things, making great claims and having eyes like a man, human leadership at the head. And in verse 21, the Bible says, I beheld the same horn. And what did it do? The Bible says the same horn made war. War with who? War with the saints, that's right, and prevailed against them. Now, if you turn to Revelation chapter 13, this horn is referred to as a beast. Revelation chapter 13, it's all about the beast. There's two beasts. The first beast has a mouth, speaks great things, just like the little horn. And if you look at verse 7, the Bible says, Revelation 13, 7, it was given to him, to this beast, to make what? To make war with the saints and to overcome them. So the beast does the same thing as the horn. Here's a statement from Michael DeSemlin in his book, All Roads Lead to Rome, page 205. I've quoted this before. He said, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cramner, in the 17th century, John Bunyan, who wrote the classic Pilgrim's Progress, the translators of the King James Bible, the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith, these men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture. And that is a fact of history, and I'm just sharing information with you. As I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, I'm not presenting these subjects to offend people or to hurt people, but as a Christian, under God, I have a conscience, and as I've studied the Bible and prophecy, I'm trying to share with you what I've learned. And it's a fact of history that countless Protestants for 300 years understood that little horn to be the papacy, to be papal Rome. What the Bible says, we've already read in Revelation 13, verse 7, and Daniel 7, verse 21, the scripture says that the beast would do what? He would make war against the saints, the saints of God. Has papal Rome made war against the saints in history? Here's a statement from William Lecky in his book, The History of the Rise of of the influence of the spirit of rationalism in Europe. And he makes this statement. He said that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood 
than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Do you see that? This fact will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. But the sad fact is today that there are hardly any Protestants left who have a competent knowledge of history who understand what has gone before, who understand the people that have lived and died for their faith and why they died. In the last hundred years, a tremendous shift has taken place in the Protestant world when it comes to preaching and teaching about Bible prophecy. It used to be that Protestants all understood that the little horn referred to the papacy in history just like the, pro the Bible says. It would come out, it would do certain things, and it did those things exactly. And this is what Protestants used to believe. But in the last hundred years, a seismic shift has taken place in prophetic thinking in the Protestant world. And now, when people think about this little horn coming out, what do they think about? They think about one evil man, one super bad guy, one uh, terrible dude, as somebody once said, who would rise up at the end of time only and make war on a group of people after the rapture, after we're gone. And what they've done is they've taken this prophecy and totally removed it from history and from us. It's amazing what has happened. And my deepest conviction, honestly, and I, I'm telling you this uh, sincerely, and truly, from the bottom of my heart, that it's my deepest conviction that these ideas about a one-man antichrist coming at the end, folks, they are no more true than the story of Alice in Wonderland or Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They're fantasy. They're illusion. They're deception. They're fiction. They're not true. They're not based upon the solid word of God. Americans today remember the Alamo, but they have forgotten the millions of lives that were sacrificed in history in the cause of Jesus Christ. They've forgotten the war that the Bible says would be made upon the saints by the beast and by the little horn of Bible prophecy. I'd like to share with you in the next few minutes some monuments of Christian history facts of history. And actually, I'd like to show you a Bible verse, too. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Then I'm going to share with you an amazing book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36. Hebrews 11 is, we call it, the, the hall of faith. The famous people of old who had faith, and many of them died for their faith. In verse 36, the Bible says others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good report through faith, the Bible looked back at the history of people who gave their lives for Jesus, and it says this was a good report that they gave as they stood up for Christ. Now, friends, history continues. History has continued for the last 2,000 years. And this book that I have in my hand right now used to be a Christian classic. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And this book is a record of the lives of people that gave their lives for Jesus Christ. This is absolutely, absolutely astonishing. The introduction of this book, it was published in the year 1563 by John Fox, and it says here in the very introduction, when one recollects that until the appearance of the Pilgrim's Progress, the common people had almost no other reading matter except their Bible and Fox's Book of Martyrs. We can understand the deep impression that this book has produced and how it served to mold the national character. This book molded the national character of nations, nations, and it describes the history of many, many martyrs and people who lost their lives for Jesus Christ. On page 40, 
43 of this book. And if you'd like to get this, you can just go to any Christian bookstore. And if they don't have it, ask them to order it. And they'll order it. They'll find it in their computer, and you can get it. On page 42, 43, it says, Disregarding the maxims and the spirit of the gospel, the papal church, arming herself with the power of the sword, vexed the church of God and wasted it for several centuries, a period most appropriately termed in history the Dark Ages. The kings of the earth gave their power to the beast. Now, folks, this is historicism. Historicism, knowing who the real beast is. And this is what Fox's Book of Martyrs says. I'm just going to share with you some monuments. We have forgotten the history of the Waldenses. You can read sometime the history of the Waldenses by J.A. Wiley, a peaceful group of people. He also wrote the history of Protestantism, famous author. The Waldenses lived in northern Italy and southern France, and there were wars of extermination. Here's a quote on the screen. During the 13th century, mass persecutions began and continued intermittently for the next 500 years. The Waldensian population was almost totally exterminated. You can read about these people. They're, they're still there in northern Italy. I had, I had the privilege of going to northern Italy. There's a town called Torre Pellice, beautiful little town. And I went up there. I found some Waldensians. They gave me and took me to a, on a tour. I went to the Waldensian Museum. I went inside a cave where the Waldensians actually gave, gave their lives and died because they were smoked out and burned out. I've seen the monument where the Waldensians joined the Protestant reformers. It's amazing. We have forgotten about a lady named Bloody Mary, Queen of England. Fox's Book of Martyrs talks all about it. Her goal was to murder and have every Protestant in England burned at the stake. Here's a quote. Mary is remembered for the hundreds of Protestants she murdered in the name of Catholicism. And I'm not saying that all Catholics are evil. Please uh, don't misunderstand me. But history is history, fact is fact, and prophecy is prophecy. And this happened. It happened in England in the 1500s. We have forgotten St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Somebody once said, blackest in the black catalog of crime, more horrible among the fiendish deeds of all the dreadful centuries was St. Bartholomew's Massacre. It was in the year 1572, August 24, in Paris, the bell tolled at midnight, and that was the signal for the slaughter. Soldiers went out, and for three days and then seven days, they slaughtered Protestants. And as it went out to cities all over France, in the next two months, 70,000 people had been brutally murdered. St. Bartholomew's Massacre, it's a fact of history. The Bible says that the little horn and the beast would make war on the saints. And that is exactly, exactly what has happened. We've forgotten the Inquisition. I mentioned this the other, other meeting. Now, I don't recommend that you do a lot of study about the Inquisition because unless you have a really strong stomach, it's just too gruesome to even really take a look at. Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about it. You can read about it if you want in this book. For 600 years, every country in Europe had its Inquisition. It was a tribunal of the Roman Church established for the investigation of heresy. It was in England. It went as far as into India. It went into South America. It went into Mexico. For 600 years, people were tortured, literally, underneath the ground in basements of monasteries in the name of Jesus Christ. It's an awful, horrible chapter. And in all of this, we simply see the fulfillment of prophecy. The scripture says that the horn and the beast would do what? would make war with the saints and overcome them. And that is a fact, a fact of history. We have forgotten Jerome of Prague, this tremendous man who was brought before a council in Constance, Germany, and Fox describes all about him. It's the whole, tells the whole story about this dear man that was placed in a prison for over a year with the rats and the cockroaches eating away at his toes. And finally, he was brought out before this big council, and then he was condemned as a heretic but he wasn't a heretic. He was a Bible-believing Christian who loved the Lord. He was eventually condemned to die. He was taken out to the stake. Fox describes the whole thing. It says here, In going to the place of execution, Jerome sang several hymns, and when he came to the final spot, it says he knelt down and he prayed fervently, and he embraced the stake with great cheerfulness. Great cheerfulness. He prayed for his enemies. He prayed for those that were lighting the flames. As the executioner walked up to him, history tells us that he looked at this man and he said, come forward boldly. 
He said, light the fire. He said, if I had been afraid, I would not be here. And they lit the flames and they began to rise. And Fox says that his final words, his final prayer was, he said, this soul in flames I offer to thee, O Christ, to Jesus. And then he died. He breathed his last breath. And friends, we have forgotten about these things, haven't we? We have forgotten about the martyrs. We have forgotten about history. We've forgotten about St. Bartholomew's Massacre and Jerome and all of these countless other people. The Bible says the little horn and the beast would make war on the saints and prophecy has been fulfilled to a T. This word has been fulfilled. The Bible has happened. It's history. These are monuments, well-documented, not just strange occurrences, but you can go into the history books and you can read all about them, all about them. This subject right now is the conclusion of the Antichrist Chronicles series. What prophecy teachers aren't telling you? I became a Christian 22 years ago, and believe me, folks, I had no idea where my study was going to take me. I had no idea that I was going to learn about these things. But God brought me to Jesus. He brought me to the cross. He showed me God's grace. Save my soul. Hallelujah. And as I continued to study prophecy, I learned things, powerful things, that are not being taught these days by a lot of people. And again, I want to say I have nothing personal against anybody. Uh, I like John Paul II. I, I pray for him, and I hope he, he'll be in heaven. I really do. And personally, there is a, there's actually a Catholic charity that I support. Uh, it's called the Covenant House. And I send, you know, not a lot, but I send some money there. I don't have a lot of money, but I send some money there because they're working with kids, street kids, and I try to help them. And, and there's a lot of Catholic people that are wonderful people that are serving the Lord as best as they can. But I feel compelled by the Spirit. Luther, Luther wrote, he said, God does not does not lead me, he pushes me. And I feel compelled to share with you the truths of the Bible. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm doing this. We remember the Alamo. We remember 189 people. We remember Travis and Crockett and Bowie and these men that risked their lives, that lost their lives for the cause of Texas freedom. But friends, as Christians, as Protestants, we, and it's sad but it's true, we have forgotten the 50 to 100 million Bible-believing Christians who lost their lives for Jesus Christ. The Bible says that this power would make war on the saints and overcome them, and that is a fact of history, and they gave a good report just like it says in Hebrews, and we need to hold on to the truths of the Bible no matter what it costs. Amen? Amen? No matter what it costs. Legend has it that Travis, before Santa Anna came across the walls and stormed into the Alamo, that he took that sword and he drew a line and he said, if you're willing to die, cross over the line. If you're not, go home. Go home. And I believe right now that God is invisibly drawing a line across this world and he is looking he's looking at you he's looking at me he's looking to see if there are people that are willing to cross over the line and to stand up for Jesus Christ even if we have to die no matter what it costs are we willing to cross over from popular errors, from false doctrines, from sincere beliefs that are just plain wrong and stand up for the truth of Jesus. Two more texts. Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, and then we'll close with chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation 17, 5. I'm sorry, verse 6. Revelation 17, 6. The scripture says... I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of who? The martyrs of Jesus. Jesus' martyrs have been slain in history. 
And God wants us to honor them and to remember them by standing up for the truths that they died for. Our last verse is chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, the 11th verse. The Bible says, They overcame him, referring to the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives, how far? To the death. And may God help us all. May he help you and may he help me to cross over the line, to stand up for Jesus, who ultimately was the greatest martyr of all, who died on the cross, shed his blood for Catholics, for Protestants, for Jews, for Muslims, for all of us, to save us by his grace. Once again, on behalf of Steve Wahlberg and all those who made this program possible, we hope you've been blessed and, of course, thank you for watching. Thank you.